Okay, uh, let's get started. It's time, time, time to begin. So, um, uh, can anybody remind us what we're talking about? Anybody remind, remember what we're doing? Or did the, did the exam sort of like, you know, blow everything out of your mind? <laughs> probably, probably. So let's, let's recall, we are in chapter seven. Right? We're in chapter seven of sequences and series of functions. And we are talking about um, two kinds of convergence, right? So there's the sort of first convergence, which was this pointwise convergence. So there was pointwise convergence. And there's also this thing called uniform convergence. Okay, and pointwise convergence meant that, right, you have some sequence, so you have some sequence of functions, right, and then you have some function that they're, conver that they're converging to, right, and pointwise convergence that meant uh, uh, on some set meant that um, at every point um, for each x and e, uh, the limit of the f of n actually existed and was this function, right? That was pointwise convergence. For every for every x, there's you know the the, the limit of the of the functions is is this guy f, right? What about for uniform convergence? What was that? Anybody remember that? Anybody remember that? Uniform convergence. Really crucial. Eli. Is it, is it uh, one n that works for all x? Right, uh, exactly, right. So here, right, what we have is that for each, for each x, you have this convergence, right? For each x, we have this thing that, you know, um, for each x, then for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists an n such that n exceeding n implies that the distance between f and x and f is smaller than epsilon. Right. So this was pointwise convergence, right? That for every x, there was, um, for every x and every epsilon, there's an n that works for that x and that epsilon, right? So this n depended on, depended on x, and it also depended on epsilon, okay? And then over here, the point, uh, the convergence was like this. You say, uh, given any, given, given any epsilon, there exists an n, uh, such that um, uh, n exceeding n implies that f of x minus f, fn x minus f of x was smaller than epsilon for all, uh, for all x in your uh, domain, right? That the n worked, uh, right? There existed this n such that this happened for all x, right? It worked for all x, so, right? Here, the n uh, would change with the x. You, you're allowed to choose a different n for, for each x. Here, uh, you're not allowed to do that. You have to be able to find an n that works for every x. Okay, and that was uniform convergence. And we were saying that uniform convergence was better than pointwise convergence. That pointwise convergence had all these uh, sort of not, not so nice things about it, right? That you could have functions that were, um, uh, you know, continuous and then they could pointwise converge to something that was discontinuous, right? Or functions that were Riemann integrable, and they pointwise converge to something that's that's not integrable, and so on and so forth, right? And we're saying that uniform convergence is something better. Okay. So, um, right, and we had this we had this image here. We had this uh, sort of picture picture where you had some domain. So let's say that this is your domain E, and we're suppose we're on the real line and we have some domain E, right? The picture here was that, um, you know, if this was your f, then given any epsilon 2, given any epsilon 2, there's a time past which the graph of all functions, the graph of all functions past that time uh, lay in that 2. Okay, so, right, everybody past a certain time lies inside that 2. 
right? Whereas for here, pointwise convergence, all we would have is that, you know, at that particular point, right, if this is f of x, then we could say that, um, we could say that at that particular point, there's a time past which all the functions lie within that, within that very, very narrow, you know, very, very thin tube, right? So just lie in that interval, right? So the f, the f sub n's, right? There's a time past which all these values lie in between those bounds, right? But for, for uniform convergence, it would, it would happen uh, over, over all, over all uh, points in your set. Okay, so that was the, that was the, the big difference. Here. Okay, so um, I don't know if this will work, but let's, let me give you an exercise to kind of remind, remind you, uh, give you uh, something to, to wake up on. Um, so the exercise is, suppose you have a bunch of functions um, on some set E, uh, and let's say that E is a subset of R, it doesn't really matter. Um, and you have some function F, and these function, the Fs of N converge uniformly to F. Okay. So you have, you have some sequence of functions that converges uniformly to something. Okay. And uh, the thing you want to show is that if the Fs of N are continuous functions, then the thing they converge to is You want to show that, um, right? If you have this tube property, if you have this tube property, um, you have these guys, and they have the tube property, then the thing that they converge to has to be continuous. Okay. So what you're going to do, right, is show that it's continuous at at every single point. So fix a point and prove that it's continuous at that point. Pick some, pick some point x naught and try to show that it's going to be continuous at that point. Okay, so I'll give you a couple minutes to think about it and then we'll talk about it together. I have a question. Hey, yeah. How do you, like, I'm trying to take a function which can possibly converge. Say it again. So, I mean, uh, you know, so a really sort of sim simple math example would be like one we did in class. Uh, like, suppose you have these constant functions. Okay, so like the first one is just one. The second one takes some values of a half. The second one, the next is a third, a fourth, and so on and so forth. Okay, so those guys, you know, here's f1, f2, f3. Right? Those guys converge uniformly to the to the to the zero function, right? That's that's one. You know, that was one example we gave. Another was so uh, the non-example we gave was um, f of x being x to the n on on zero one, right? That's so that's not an example because um, that converges to uh, those guys will converge to. Um, Zero everywhere and one here. Right? Those guys will converge to this, but that's you know um, that convergence is not, turns out to be not not uniform.
Okay, let's uh, let's try and work on this together. So um, first off, uh, what do we want to show? Right, we want to show that this guy want to show that f is continuous at some arbitrary point x naught. Right. So what does that mean? Somebody tell me the definition of continuity. What does continuity mean? Eric. The limit uh, as um, t approaches x naught of t equals to f. Oh, f plus x naught. Sure. Right. So the limit as t approaches x of f of t, it, it turns out to be x naught. Right. Um, let's uh, I, let's say that in, in epsilon epsilon delta language, right? That means that given any epsilon, there exists a delta such that if x lies in the delta neighborhood of x naught, then f of x uh, lies in the epsilon neighborhood of f of x naught. Right. So pictorially, right here is f of x naught. <laughs> And some of, you want to show that given any epsilon, so here's the epsilon neighborhood, you know, plus epsilon minus epsilon, then there's going to be some delta, delta neighborhood over here, so that everybody in the delta neighborhood, so x naught plus delta, x naught minus delta, everybody in the delta neighborhood is going to lie between, lie in the epsilon neighborhood of f of x naught. Okay, so we want to ensure, we want to find the delta neighborhood that works here. Right? We want to find the delta neighborhood so that all the outputs, all the outputs lie between these bars. Okay? What do we know? We know that the f's events are continuous, and we know that the f's events converge uniformly to f. Right? We can make the f's events, we know that the f's events themselves, you know, have this neighborhood property. Right? Individually they have this neighborhood property. Right? And we also know that we can get them as close to f as we desire. Okay, okay. So let's think, right? If we can, so think like this, right? If we can make them as close to f as we desire, then they're basically f, right? They're basically f. And if they're basically f and they're continuous, then f ought to be continuous, <laughs> right? So that's kind of your, 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 your intuition, right? It ought to be, it ought to work out because look, we can make these guys as close to f as we desire. Right? So let's, let's try to put that uh, uh, intuition uh, into, you know, into action. Okay. So let's say, okay, let's um, uh, choose an n uh, such that n exceeding n implies that um, the distance between f n of x and f of x is smaller than epsilon over, over n of 3. Everywhere. So all for all x. Okay. So somebody wants us to stay, somebody wants our f to vary less than epsilon. Right? They want our f to vary less than epsilon here. Let's choose an epsilon over 3, 2. Is 3 arbitrary? Uh, it, well, sort of, yeah. I mean, we could choose, like, uh, if it were my advisor, he would say, like, choose this over a million. E, you know, epsilon over a million, right? So it turns out that three is probably where you want to do it, but it, it, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so you just you know, you know, choose something very small, okay? Okay, we want our f to vary less than epsilon, right? And we know that it's gonna stay within epsilon over three of something that's continuous, right? Right? So you see that that pretty much does it for us, right? Because we know that, so there's going to be somebody inside here. There's going to be somebody inside here. We know that. Right? We know that there's somebody inside here. Let's call it F sub, uh, F sub capital N. Okay. Let's take, let's take F sub capital N where, you know, F sub capital N is somebody who lies inside the, the epsilon over 3 tube. Okay. We know that f sub capital N is continuous, right? Right. So we can we can find a delta neighborhood where that guy varies, you know, doesn't vary very much, right? Like by epsilon. That guy varies by epsilon over a million, 
right? And the distance between uh, f sub n and f is less than epsilon over a million. And so f can't grade by, by more than, you know, by very much. Okay, so that's, that's, the, that's the idea, right? Okay, so you say, okay. Um, uh, uh, right? So in particular, in particular, this works for, for f sub n. But we also know that S of n is continuous. S of n is continuous. So we know that there exists a uh, delta neighborhood such that um, if x lies in n delta x naught, then um, fn x minus fn x naught is smaller than epsilon over two. We know that we can find a delta neighborhood that works for that single guy who is lying inside the two, right? Because that guy was continuous, right? So then what can we say about f, right? Does then f of x, does then f of x minus um, f of x naught uh, satisfy this, the inequality that we want? You say, well, look, you know, you know, f of x minus f of x naught is smaller than f of x minus f sub n of x plus f sub n of x minus f of n f sub n of x naught, right? Plus f sub n of x naught minus f sub f of x of naught. Right. This distance is smaller than twice the dis twice the the difference between x and x naught. Right. Twice the maximum distance. Right. Which we know is smaller than epsilon over three, plus the variation of of f sub n, which is smaller than epsilon over three also. Right. So we get. Uh, we get the epsilon we want. Right? Right? If we chose any x inside here, we know that the difference between f, f at x, and f at x naught right, is controlled by you know, you know, the difference of f of x from f of, f of n at x plus this plus that. I, I'm not going to say it again. Okay, so yeah, so it is true that if you have a bunch of uniform, if you have a bunch of, if you have a bunch of continuous functions and they converge uniformly, then <laughs> the thing that they can, the limit is also continuous, right? And that was not true for pointwise con uh, converging functions. Do you have a question, book? Yeah, no, you're good. Okay. Okay, anybody, everybody all right with that? Yeah? Any questions? Okay. So the the the, uh, the result that they give in the book is actually stronger than that. It's sort of a generalization, slight you know, slight generalization of that. Um, uh, it has this it has this this fact as a corollary. Um, let's let's prove it uh, just to show uh, just to show how it works. It's, it's almost the same argument, but we need to do a little bit more. Um, so they say, okay, suppose you have a bunch of, um, of functions, um, sequence of functions, and you have some point, you have some limit point of E. Okay, so the difference is that we're not saying that the functions are defined at E, uh, at, at, at X. Okay, over here, our, our, all of, everything was defined at X, but over here, we, we, our functions are defined on E, and X is in E prime. So we don't know about value. We don't have we don't have values at x, okay. But we can still prove something similar. Okay. So then, if um, f of n converges to f uniformly, 
on E, uh, then the limit of f of t as t approaches x is the same thing as the limit um, of f of n of t as t approaches x as n goes to infinity. Okay, so this is one of those things where you, it's a change the order sort of result, right? You can, you can switch the order. Because this, this f of t, remember, is the limit of the s of x of t as, as n goes to infinity. So it's saying that you can take the limit as n goes to infinity first, and then let t go to x. Or you can let t go to x, you can let t go to x first, and then let n go to infinity. Okay, so your picture in your head should be something like this. Your E, your E is some sort of open set, and then your X is something on the boundary, and your X is some limit point here, right? And you've got a bunch of functions, right? And they converge to, they converge to some F, right? They converge to some F, but they don't necessarily, nobody has values at X, okay? And what this is saying is that you can take the limit, you can go to X first, and then take the limit, or you can take the limit first, you can take the limit first and then go to x. Okay, and either way you're gonna get the same answer. Okay, and you see that um, if we assume that uh, f sub n are all continuous at, continuous at x, and f is, continu f is defined at x, then this is a continuity statement. Right, because this is saying that um, the limit of f of t as t approaches x is, um, Uh, is f f of x? <laughs> right. right. This this would be this would be this would be f of x. If we if we assume that everybody is continuous and defined, then this is going to be f of x. Right. So that this would just be a continuity statement. Let me erase that because that's not what we're saying right now. Everybody, everybody all right? <laughs> you don't look all right, but all right. <laughs> it's okay, you don't have to, you can, you can, you can lie slightly. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, okay, so let's, let's do it. Um, so, Let's see. Okay, so the proof will be in two parts. So step one: um, let a sub n be the limit of f n t as t approaches x. Okay, so we're going to call each of these things a sub n. Okay, so. Um, you know, the first problem is that, so the a sub n's are the limits, right, of each of these, each of these guys, right? So, um, uh, right, so you look at f1, you look at f1, and see what the limit is, that's a1. Look at f2, see what the limit is, that's a2. And you get these values, right? Values a1, a2, a3, and so on and so forth. Okay, and so the first thing we need to do is show that that converges. Okay, so claim um, the a sub n converges the sequence converges. Okay. okay, so the way we're going to show it is to show that, um, uh, it suffices to show that the a sub n is Cauchy. Right, because these are all complex values. We show the Cauchy, then it, then it converges, and right? then it's 
because complex numbers are complete. Okay. So it suffices to show that they're Cauchy, and um, uh, well, does anybody see how to show that they're Cauchy? What do we do to need to what do we need to do to show that um, that they're Cauchy? What's Cauchy again? Remember? We can make them close enough close to each other, right? We want to make the epsilon, I'm sorry, given any epsilon, we want to find an n such that past that n everybody's close to each other. Right? We have that the f sub n converge uniformly on E, right? So remember the Cauchy, uh, so recall that S of n converging uniformly, um, if we state it in the Cauchy way, is that, you know, given in the epsilon, there exists an n such that um, if n and n exceed n, then, um, then fn x minus fm x is smaller than epsilon uh, for all x in our space, right? That we had some sort of uniform, right? Uniform convergence meant that we satisfied the, the Cauchy criterion, criterion uniformly, right? Okay, so I'm gonna do this, um, so certainly we can do that for epsilon, uh, epsilon over two, so for fixed epsilon, we know that there exists a time past which the, the distance between any two functions at any point is smaller than epsilon over 2. Okay. okay. But this is true for. for all the n and n bigger than n, so when we take the limit, right, when we take the limit, um, we see that, uh, when we take the limit as x approaches, I'm sorry, uh, this should be x naught, right, when we take the limit as x approaches x naught, this is still going to be true, right? Because I mean, well, we might get a we might get a, an equal sign here in that limit, but it will be less than epsilon. So then, take the limit let let x approach x naught, we get a sub n minus a sub m is less than or equal to epsilon over two, which is less than epsilon. Right? And so we see that the sequence is Cauchy. Okay, and so it converges to something. So A sub n converges to something, call it some, some number A. And now we want to see that that um, that the limit of f of t as t approaches x is that is that a. Okay. And we basically play exactly the same game that we just that we just played. We're going to choose we're going to choose a tube. We're going to um, use a new uniform convergence, and we're going to use um, the continuity of a of one of one of the f events. Okay, we'll do exactly the same thing we just did. So let's let's do that. So part two, uh, part two, we want to show that um, the limit claim is that the limit of f of t as t approaches x, t approaches x is that thing. Okay. So what do we do? We say, well. We're going to play the we're going to play the, the game again. So um, let's see. Uh, f sub n converges to f uniformly. Right. 
right? And we know that a sub n converges to n. A sub n converges to n, right? So then, so there exists some capital N such that um, when the distance between capital N and uh, F, the distance between F sub capital N and F is smaller than epsilon over 3 for all X. And, and the distance between A sub N and A is less than epsilon over 3. So we use the tube, the tube condition as before. Right? We use the tube condition, and we know that these guys are converging, the cosinus that we just proved. Okay. Um, remember what we're hoping for. Um, we want, uh, we want, oh, sorry, there should be x naught again, sorry. We want a neighborhood of x naught in which f of t minus a is smaller than epsilon. Right. We want to show that given an epsilon, there exists a delta. Right. There exists a there exists a delta neighborhood, a delta neighborhood. There exists a delta neighborhood. Okay. There exists a delta neighborhood of X in which is this true. Okay. okay. So um, uh, we just do exactly the same thing as before. Right? We just say, well, look, um, right? we know that uh, uh, we know that there's a delta neighborhood that works for f sub n. The f sub n is are continuous. Right? F sub n is continuous. So there's this a delta neighborhood for that guy. There's a delta neighborhood such that um, Fn Wait, hold on a second. I'm messing up a little, I think. Let me think of what we got. What do we have already? We, we're trying to control this thing. Sorry. We're trying to control this thing, right? And we know that that's controlled by um, the distance of, make sure I get this right, f of t minus fn, f capital mt plus fnt minus minus a sub n plus a sub n minus a. So I'm sorry, so I made a mistake. So here's what here's the mistake. We're not using the continuity here. We're using that the limit of s sub n of x is a sub n as x approaches x naught. Right. <laughs> because we don't have continuity. <laughs> we don't have continuity at x naught. Right? That's I, I was getting confused with the previous problem. So there's a delta neighborhood in which this thing is small, right? Because this is the limit, right? This is the limit. We don't have continuity, but we know the limit of this thing is, is this thing.
Okay. So then, then the distance between this thing is controlled by the sum of, of these of these three things, right? But um, this guy is controlled by the uniform continuity, right? This thing is controlled because this was the Cauchy sequence that we showed that we proved, and this thing is controlled because we're in we're in the neighborhood, right? We're in that in that delta neighborhood. You know, this central the central thing is, is controlled by epsilon over three, and so we get the epsilon that we have desired. Okay, so it's basically the same basically the same proof as, as before. Okay, but you just have to be a little bit more careful um, because uh, you need to show that this limit actually exists. Yeah, Eric. So a sub n is not the same thing as f sub n of x naught? There is no f sub n of x naught. Okay. Yeah, it would be. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, that's, that's the only difference, basically. Right? Our functions aren't defined at x naught. x naught was a limit point of the set. The functions were, were defined on some set. x naught is a limit point of the set, not necessarily in, in the set itself. Right? But yeah, if you're thinking of it as an analogy, then yes, right, to, to what we were doing before. That x naught, that x naught is, is a sub n, a sub n is the value of, in the previous case, a sub n is f sub n of x naught. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay, how's everybody doing? So, so, any questions? Any questions? Take a minute and talk to, talk to each other and see if you can formulate a question in case. Uh, Because the sizes are all going to be real numbers, right? Um, right? The size of complex numbers are all real numbers. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. See, and so um, yeah. I mean, basically, what we're doing here is looking at the distances. Yeah. Yeah. So. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. We're not looking at the values, but the distances. Any any question? Any other questions? You have a question? No. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So that's uh, that's kind of our first um, first good result about uniform convergence, right? It says that um, if, you, if you have continuous functions and you look at they converge uniformly to something, then that thing is going to be continuous. Okay. Um, So um, uh, let's see. So um, one comment on um, uh, 
what guarantees uniform convergence? Right? If uniform convergence is a good thing, you know, what, what gives us uniform convergence? What ensures that we have uniform convergence? So you might hope, you might hope that, uh, say, pointwise convergence on a compact set implies uh, uniform convergence, right? Maybe akin to like uh, continuity. Continuity on a on a compact set implies uh, uniform uniform continuity. Right? So maybe you're hoping that pointwise convergence on a compact set ensures uniform convergence. But actually, our, our previous example, one of the first examples we saw, shows that that's not the case. Right? So we had on zero one, right? We had these guys, f of x to x to the n, right? And those guys converged to um, the function which was 0 uh, if x was not equal to 1, right? And 1 if x equals 1, right? But that convergence, although it was pointwise on a, on a, on a compact set, was not a uniform convergence, okay? So we don't, we don't have that. Um, this is something that, that we care about. Um, we, we'd, like to, we'd like to know some conditions under which we, we've, we've got uniform convergence. Um, okay, so it's, you know, it's, that's, it's unfortunate that it's not so, not so simple. Um, we, do have one, we do have the following theorem, which is kind of nice. So um, uh, suppose you have a pointwise convergence. On some set, on some set K, um, if you know that f sub n and f are all continuous, if you know that um, the f sub n are decreasing in value, so you know as as you go higher up with your index, they get they get lower and lower. Um, um, and you know that K is compact, then you're actually guaranteed that um, the convergence is uniform. Okay. So here are some conditions under which Pointwise convergence does turn into pointwise convergence on a compact set. Actually, does turn into uniform convergence. Okay. So notice that. Um, our situation looks something like this, right? You've got you've got functions, and they're decreasing, um, and there's some function down here that they're decreasing to, so f1, f2, and so on and so forth. Okay, and they're converging pointwise, and you want to show that they 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 satisfy the two condition. Okay, so here's the picture. Okay, so here's the proof. Right. So we want to show uniform convergence. In other words, we want to show that given an epsilon, given an epsilon, um, there exists an n such that whenever you're past that n, um, the distance between f sub n and f is smaller than epsilon for everybody in x for everybody in your, in your set. Okay, that's just the definition. Right. Notice that I can get rid of the absolute value signs right, because these functions are, are decreasing. Right. Um, 
And further, if I show it for, 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 for some n, then it's going to be true for all, all n that are after that n. Right? Because if I, show it for, if I show that the distance is smaller than epsilon for this guy, well, everybody else is lower than that. Right? So the distance is just going to get smaller. Right? The distance is just going to get smaller. So observe that it suffices to show the above for some a single a single n. Right? Because once we show it for that single n, then it's true for all n that, that are past that, that single n. Is that okay? Is that okay? Okay, so we pull a, we do a kind of funny trick. We say, well, um, consider this set, k sub n. k sub n is going to be the set of points in k where the difference between f n and f, I guess I don't need these absolute value signs, um, is too big. Okay. Right? We would like we would like this thing to be less than less than epsilon everywhere. Well let's look at the places where it's bigger than or equal to epsilon. Okay. Okay. Then, right, um, notice that uh, if we can show we need to show it suffices to show that um, k sub n is empty for some n. Right? Because if it's empty, that means that all the values, all the values, oops, sorry, this should be a capital N. Because this N should be the same as this N. Okay. Um, okay. So for Actually, let me, sorry, let me make this both lowercase. And it was one, two, three, four, five. Because we, we're going to look, we're going to look at all these, you know, there's, there's one case of n for every, for every, you know, natural number n. Okay. And we want to show that one of those guys is, is empty. Because then we know that at that point, all the values are within epsilon of each other. No, no points are, Greater than, greater than or equal to epsilon away from each other. Okay. Okay. So, uh, and we do that in kind of a clever way. We say, well, look, uh, think. Um, first off, uh, the um, the case of n are nested. So, case of n includes k sub n plus 1, right? Because the points where the n sub n plus 1th guy is more than epsilon away from f, if that guy is more than epsilon away from f, then the, the, the previous guy is even farther away from f, right? So we have this containment, right? We have this nesting, right? For all n. Right? Second observation, all the cases of n are compact. All the cases of n are compact. Um, uh, the reason for this, why? Anyway, can anybody see why, why the cases of n are compact? Or let me just, let me say that, can anybody show me that the cases of n are closed? If we show that they're closed, we're inside K, which is a compact set. So closed inside compact implies compact. So all we need to do is show that the case of N are closed. Why are the case of N closed? Let me let me um, head you off <laughs> before we go that way. And 
Let me, okay. So here's a kind of cute way to see that they're closed. Um, remember that f sub n is continuous, and all the f sub n are continuous, and the f is also continuous, right? So this thing is continuous, right? The difference function is continuous, right? If you take a difference of continuous functions, or some, right, it's definitely still continuous, right? Now, what's k sub n? k sub n is the preimage. Let's call this thing g sub n. Okay. This function g sub n, the difference guy, is continuous. And k sub n is the preimage of uh, the closed interval epsilon infinity. Right? right? It's the places, it's all the points where the difference is bigger, is bigger than or equal to epsilon, right? So it's the preimage, it's the preimage of through, through g sub n of the closed interval epsilon in, infinity, right? So it's the preimage of a closed set through a con continuous function, and you remember that continuous functions pull back um, closed sets to closed sets and open sets to open sets, right? So k sub n is closed. And it's a subset of a compact set, so it's compact. Sorry. Um, sorry to ask for possible answers and then not ask what your answer actually was. <laughs> um, do you want to do you want to say what you were thinking, Keisha? Oh, no, okay. Um, okay. So we've got these. Uh, we've got nested compact sets. Right? We've got nest, nested compact sets, and let's look at the intersection of them. What if we take the intersection of all the case events? Right? We're looking at all the points for which the distance between f sub n and f sub x is greater than epsilon. But now we're taking the intersection, so it's got to be greater than epsilon for every single n. All points x for which for every single n, the distance between f sub n and f is bigger than, bigger than or equal to epsilon. What points are in this set? Right. This is x and k such that the distance between f sub n and f is bigger than or equal to epsilon for all n. We fixed an epsilon, fixed an epsilon, right? We fixed an epsilon, and we're saying we're looking at the points for where the distance between these two things is bigger than epsilon for all n. Stephen? No? Is it empty? The empty set, right? Because uh, f sub n converges to f point minus, right? So this can't be true for, for all n, right? <laughs> right? The f sub, f sub n of x converges to f of x. So eventually, it's going to be within epsilon. Right? So this is empty. Right? And we know that f n x converges to f of x. OK. OK, so, so what's the problem here? We've got nested compact sets, and their intersection is empty. Does this remind you of anything from a long time ago? Nested compact sets, something intersection, intersection is non-empty, something. You guys remember this? OK, so we have this uh, thing called the finite intersection property. right? We said that if these guys 
if these sets were nested and compact and satisfy the finite intersection property, then you're guaranteed that the, that the infinite intersection is going to be non-empty also. Right? The finite intersection property meant that some, there was some finite, uh, that every finite subcollection had a non-empty intersection. Right? So what we're seeing is that um, this has to, these guys have to fail the finite intersection property. Right? There must be some finite intersection of these guys where the intersection is empty. Right? So what do we get? Uh, there must be a finite intersection intersection of the case of ends, right? Kn1 and Kn, 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 Kn. Uh, that is empty, right? Because if they were all non-empty, we would satisfy the finite intersection property, and then we know that there should be somebody in the in the in the intersection of everybody. Okay, right? Right. So the intersection must be empty, um, but these guys are are decreasing, right? These guys are decreasing, so the intersection is just the smallest one, right? So it's the um, k sub max of the n sub n sub n sub uh, n sub box, right? The the one with the biggest index must be uh, must be empty, right? So we know that um, one of them must be empty. Must be the empty set. And that's what we wanted, right? We wanted to show that one of them was empty, and so we found it. Okay. So uh, point-wise convergence under certain conditions does imply uniform convergence. Yes? What if we had like, an alternating set of functions to where then the second condition might be satisfied? If you have some, like if you were alternating, like say your, your set of functions was like had negative one and the other, so then you're not guaranteed one and less than that. I'm I'm sorry, uh, James, I, I can't hear you. So what? Like so what happens if they're alternating? If they're alternating, so then you might not have the second condition be satisfied, even though they're still getting smaller. So. Oh, you mean the, the, the magnitudes are getting smaller? Yeah, so the magnitudes are getting smaller, but not necessarily. Yeah, you see that that's not going to, uh, that the proof is not going to work in that case, right? Um, uh, so you're wondering, like, what can you say in that condition under that case? I was just wondering if it's all no, no, I don't, I don't think so. I, I, I can't think of a counterexample immediately, but, but I can try. <laughs> It might, be, it might be true. It might be true. I don't, I don't know. Let me, let me think about it. Okay. Um, okay. Let's go on to the next, next idea. Um, okay. So. Um, Okay, so we're going to digress this a little bit and talk about something called the suit norm network on the uh, continuous functions, continuous bounded functions. So I'll, let me define this in a second. So um, you have uh, x metric space. And we define curly C of x 
as um, the complex value functions on that space that are continuous and bounded. Okay, so we're only going to look at the functions that are continuous and, and bounded. Okay. Um, then um, for functions in C of X, we define uh, a norm as the supremum of the absolute value of f of x as x ranges over the space. Okay, and this is called the supremum, the supremum norm. Okay, and from that norm, we define a metric. So if we have two, two functions in our space, we define a distance between them, distance between f and g, as the soup norm of the difference. that this is a metric. This actually is, is a metric. It satisfies the triangle inequality, etc., etc. Okay, so uh, that gives us a metric space. Right? So we have this metric space, this thing with this metric. Continuous, the bounded and continuous functions on this on this metric space with this soup soup norm uh, related distance is a metric space. Okay, so let me ask you. Um, uh, uh, what does Fn converges to F in this metric space mean. What does convergence in this metric space mean? Right, we know what it means for a sequence of points, a sequence of points to converge in a metric space. Right? Well, what does that mean? You've got a sequence. Of, you've got these points in your metric space, and they converge to this point in your metric space. Right? It means, right, of course, that for all x line greater than zero, there's just an n such that n exceeding n implies that the distance, right, the distance between x of n and n is smaller than epsilon. What does that mean? Eric? Is it like you can see the space is complete? No. Um, I mean, it, it will turn out to be complete. We, we shall see in a moment that it is complete. But all I'm, here, all, all I'm asking here is what, what does uniform, <laughs> what does convergence mean? What does convergence mean in this metric space? Teja? It's uniform. It's uniform convergence. <laughs> yeah. So this, this turns out to be uniform convergence, right? Because converging with respect to this metric, what does that mean? That means that the distance between these guys is smaller than epsilon, right? But the distance being smaller than epsilon means that the supremum of the difference of the values as x ranges over x is smaller than epsilon, right? But that's uniform convergence, right? That's saying that these guys all lie within epsilon of, of, of this everywhere. 
right? This is the everywhere, right? The difference between f sub n and f is smaller than epsilon over the whole space, right? So that's aka uniform convergence. Okay. Okay. And so the last thing I want uh, we're going to look at is uh, what Eric was just saying. Um, that uh, this space is actually complete. So here I'm, um, this space, this space with um, this metric is actually complete. It's a complete norm of metric space. Yes, Tatum? Can you remind me what it means to it means that all, com all Cauchy sequences converge. Okay. So it's, it's actually what's called a complete, this, this space turns out to be what's called a complete normed vector, uh, com com I'm sorry, complete normed uh, metric space, which is also called a Banach space. If you go on to functional analysis, you'll see things called Banach spaces. Um, you know, that's, that's a, a, a significant concept uh, in, in functional analysis. Okay. So your first, first view of a box space. Um, okay, so let's prove it. Okay. We want to show that, that every Cauchy sequence um, actually, actually converges. So, uh, Let's say that f sub n is a Cauchy sequence in this space. Okay. okay. So uh, so uh, so what does that mean? Right. That means that. For all epsilon greater than zero, there exists an n past which, uh, past which we have that the, the norm of uh, f sub n and m is smaller than epsilon. Right, but that's the um, that is the uh, Cauchy criterion for uniform convergence. Right, that's the Cauchy criterion for uniform convergence, right? That's, that's exactly the Cauchy criterion for uniform convergence. Um, and so uh, that implies that there exists an f uh, uh, such that the f sub n converge uniformly to f. Right? We, know these, we know these guys converge uniformly. Right? We know these things converge uniformly. They converge to something. Right? So they converge to, um, to to some f. Okay. So the only question is, is this f in our space? Right. Is this f? Is f actually in the continuous continuous bounded functions? Well, is it continuous? Yes. Right. Why? Because of what we just proved, exactly. Right. These guys were all, these guys were already in our space, so they're all continuous. 
right? And if they are continuous functions and they converge, uni converge uniformly to something, then that something is continuous. Right? So we just showed, so we just showed that f must be continuous. Okay. Now what about bounded? Um, does f have to be bounded? If each of these guys is bounded, does f have to be bounded? Sure, right? You, you, you kind of, you know, you feel in your gut that that ought to be true, right? Because you know, right, if f, if these guys can converge uniformly to f, we know that we can make them all stay within one of f. Right, past a point. We can find somebody, at least. We can find some, there's going to be some f sub n that lies inside the plus 1, minus 1, plus 1, minus 1, 2. Right? So that guy, there's going to be some f sub n that lies inside of that tube. But f sub n is bounded. Right? f sub n is bounded and differs from f by, by less than 1. Right? So f also has to be bounded. Right? So, um, so um, this sort of argument shows that f must also be bounded. So, so yeah, so um, uh, there is something that they converge to, and that thing actually is in the space. Yes, Keisha? Is the absolute being bounded in the domain? I'm sorry? Is, uh, uh, is the absolute being bounded in that being bounded in the domain if they were being bounded in the domain? No, because your, your first function could be unbounded. Right? Like you could have some crazy first function, say, that, that goes like this, say. And that would be an unbounded function. Is that what you're asking? Well, there are cases in like all the effects that are unbounded because of all the things. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, I must have misunderstood you. Yeah. Say your question. So if all of the effects are unbounded, yeah. and the uniformly converges to f, yeah. then f is bounded, right? Yes. And does it um, go backwards if f is bounded and f sub n uniformly converts back with all the f sub n bounded? Oh, so you're asking if, um, I mean, they're all, they're all individually bounded, but that's what, what you're asking is, is there a bound that works for every single one of them? Yeah. Are they uniformly bounded? Uh, I think. Yeah, yes, yes. Because right, um, there's going to be a bound that works for everybody, everybody inside this tube, right? And then there's only finitely many guys outside of the tube, right? Proceed. There's only finitely. There's going to be. There's going to be a time past which everybody lies in the tube, and so they all have some uniform. Those guys all have a definite uniform bound, and there's only finitely many other guys. So you take the maximum bound for everybody else. And the map, and this, and this, and that will bound everybody. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. I'll see you next time. <laughs>